Next speaker is Dr. Henry Dungu, who is from the Ugandan Cancer Institute and Makere University College of Health Sciences in Kampala, Uganda. He's going to be speaking on transfusion therapy and cancer. Thank you very much for the introductions. Cancer can be prevented through immunization. When you see these young girls showing their deltoids for a shot of a vaccine, it could be one of the ways of preventing cancer, especially in women. So we're going to talk about transfusion therapy in cancer patients. And um, the burden of cancer is enormous. When you look at uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, much as I think people used to think that cancer is not a, a main problem in countries like Africa or in Uganda, but it's actually a big problem. We have uh, breast, uh, cervix, liver, and others. But we need to remember that actually some of these cancers, when you look at cancer of the liver, it can be prevented because most of it is as a result of hepatitis B, which can be prevented. And there are a number of challenges. I, I think since yesterday when we were talking, everyone has been mentioning challenges associated with blood availability in Africa. In Sub-Saharan Africa, there's less access to blood. And Blood shortages are everywhere. We've noted that the rate of blood donation per 1,000 population is low in Sub-Saharan Africa. The proportion of whole blood made into components. We, we, we are not so much into component therapy. We are still giving a lot of whole blood. Rather than saying, let's give red cells, let's give plasma, let's give platelets. We are still using whole blood. And we think that there is excess use of products because of lack of standardized guidelines to appropriate usage. I'm currently working uh, for my training program on factors that might actually be, how should I say it, looking at optimal use of blood products, particularly platelets in cancer patients. But we need to understand what is the problem? So appropriate blood use in cancer medicine is important for the national blood program. And you know, when we talk about blood, and I see the National Blood Bank here, I feel privileged because these campaigns are going to continue, and uh, they are going to help us implement these campaigns. We all think that most of the blood actually goes to pediatrics because of malaria. But look at what this study shows. Actually, this is a study in Uganda, Mulago Hospital. It was published recently um, in Transfusion Medicine. And 33% of usage went to cancer patients. That further emphasizes that cancer patients consume a lot of blood. Okay? And there are a number of challenges associated with use of blood. And even if we are repeating this, it's been said many times, we have to emphasize the fact that an a transfusion that has not been given, I think, is the best. If you have ways of avoiding a transfusion, to me, I think that would be the best. But transfusion saves lives. In Burkina Faso, they found a high prevalence of viral markers in first-time volunteers and a high incidence of infections in repeat donors. So the issue of transfusion, transmissible infections is a challenge. In Uganda, published in the, East, in the Africa Health Sciences Journal, they found a high prevalence of uh, hepatitis C virus, and this was at 2.5% among sickle cell anemia patients. And transfusion was thought to be a major contributing factor. In Kenya, 
a high prevalence of CMV antibodies was found among blood donors. And in Zimbabwe, significantly higher HIV rates in first time donors compared to repeat donors. So this emphasizes the fact that transfusion transmissible infections remain a challenge uh, of, of blood safety. Yesterday we talked about transfusion reactions and transfusion reaction surveillance systems have not been well widely established. When we had a discussion yesterday, Mr. Ika said, looks like we don't get these reactions because no one reports them. You all heard that. You know, there's a way Mr. Ika brings out his issues in a challenging way. We, we don't have surveillance systems to ensure that we can report these. A study in Namibia, the estimated actual, the estimated actual rate of acute transfusion reactions was found to be higher than the rate reported to the National Hemovigilance System. And a study in Uganda, again, acute transfusion reactions may occur more commonly in resource-limited settings. And this study called on improved surveillance systems and implementation of transfusion guidelines. So that is another challenge about blood safety in Africa. So my message to you for this lecture, given the demands of cancer treatment on the blood supply and the challenges of blood safety, cancer medicine specialists need to develop unique approaches to blood transfusion support that are specific to the needs of patients with cancer in Sub-Saharan Africa. So this is my main message to you all. Even if you're not a cancer specialist, but by the fact that you're actually a user of blood, it also concerns you. Okay. Anemia and thrombocytopenia are commonly seen in cancer patients. And the causes of anemia in cancer are actually many. There's blood loss. You have situations where the bone marrow is infiltrated, hence inhibiting red blood cell production. You find a marrow that is packed with cancer cells, and you cannot produce any cells. Chronic kidney disease, inflammatory inflammation that leads to functional iron deficiency, chemotherapy, and radiotherapy. We all know that these are contributors to anemia in cancer patients, as well as thrombocytopenia. So these are the factors for anemia could actually be the same for thrombocytopenia, which is a very common problem. When you look at red blood cell transfusion at the Uganda Cancer Institute, and much as I've said red blood cells, this also includes whole blood, because not all the time that we are getting red cells. We estimate that up to 40% of usage goes to people with acute leukemia. And chronic leukemia, as well as lymphoma, will take about 10 and 20% respectively. Of course, multiple myeloma patients and solid tumor patients also need blood most of the time, especially when they are on myeloablative treatments. When it comes to platelet transfusion, I believe in Uganda we are the biggest consumers of platelets from the Uganda Blood Transfusion Services. But the demand for platelets far exceeds the supply. On average, about six patients need platelets per day. And this is when we are looking at those who have a platelet count of maybe less than 20,000, or those who are actively bleeding which means the need is up to 36 units per day. I'm talking about the donor units. But the average supply is six units. Of course, the days when you get high, when you get low. And the good thing is that when I call Grace, when I call uh, my brother the other side, oh my God, we're in trouble. Yesterday, you saw me walking up and down. 
A pediatric oncologist kept on calling that this child has been bleeding since last night, and we didn't have platelets. So I went to Ezra, and Ezra said, send someone. <laughs> because they can get. And actually, when they went, they got some. So the demand is bigger than what is currently supplied. And of course, we don't have guidelines on platelet transfusion at the Cancer Institute. Neither do we have for Uganda in general. Then the, there's no standardized practice. Usually, we give therapeutic transfusions. And prophylactic transfusions are rare, probably due to the lack of supply. Patients' outcomes, therefore, are not guaranteed. One of my friends within this house, I think he's trying to do a study on, on this one, whether actually we can guarantee the outcome of the current transfusion practices uh, using platelets. It's always important to, to have a CBC, to know what you're going to do, rather than just treating blindly. So a CBC can guide us in transfusion therapy among cancer patients. And of course, this is the Uganda Cancer Institute. We have these machines there. We usually do a CBC on every patient before we transfuse. We don't depend on pala. We don't depend on, because other factors could contribute to that. And this is a very common picture to you all. When we print out, this is what we give you. But sometimes we tell you, focus on a few things. What is the hemoglobin? How many people are going to transfuse this patient? By show of hands. OK. No one is going to transfuse. Because this patient, the chances of them being anemic are like 99% not there. If someone has a hemoglobin of 14. But if you didn't do a CBC and just look at someone, you might say they are anemic and you want to order for a blood product. So it's important to have these parameters. And usually, looking at that MCV, you get a rough idea of whether this is normocytic or it's microcytic because you have so many patients with uh, a, a, a severe I mean, iron deficiency. Transfusion in cancer care in sub saharan Africa, we need to look at this. What are the traditional indications for transfusion of red blood cells? To review new studies demonstrating that more conservative use is safe and effective. To many of you, if you talk about being conservative, you're like, oh my god, what if this patient gets into problems? And pharmacological agents, pharmacologic agents that can supplement transfusion support. I think we need to think of going that way and see how we can reduce on transfusion. Looking at indications as per the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, the NCCN in the US, the goal is usually to prevent or treat deficit of oxygen supplied by blood. And anemia in setting of acute coronary syndrome, they indicate that let's give transfusion when someone's hemoglobin is less or equal to 10. Symptomatic anemia, when they have a hemoglobin of, I mean, 8 to 10, as a way of preventing symptoms. And of course, in hemodyn hemodynamically stable patients without acute coronary syndrome, they recommend hemoglobin of up to 9. But these are not Ugandan guidelines. When you come for the next meeting, I'll give you the guidelines for Uganda. So. Recent clinical trials demonstrate that we can conserve red blood cells. Anyone disagrees? OK, let's look at the evidence. Uh, a series of randomized trials in North America, transfusion in the intensive care unit. It was a mild center trial in Canada. Patients were not actively bleeding. They were expected to survive for more than 24 hours and they're not moribund. So this was a randomized study where they looked at a restrictive strategy of transfusing when hemoglobin is between 7 and 9, and then a liberal strategy of hemoglobin 10 to 12 grams. Okay? And in the restrictive strategy, only 66% were transfused. And of course, in the liberal, 100% were transfused. Looking at survival among these patients, 
One of you can tell me what the difference was. P value is 0 0.1. And when you look at this Kaplan Meyer curve, actually, I think there's no difference, right? There's no difference. Whether you give too much or you restrict, survival remains the same. Again, supporting the evidence that you can go restrictive. Now, we have a number of other randomized trials of red blood, trans red blood cell transfusion thresholds. We have an adult ICU setting where the trigger was seven versus nine. It's a big number of participants. It's a big study. In 2006, Kirpalami, they have infants of less than one kilogram, hemoglobin 10 to 12. Um, quite a number of other studies. And when you look at this, for example, you look at the Carson 2011 focus study where the, they were working with Dr. Kajia. Okay, no, hip surgery. Dr. Kajia didn't work. They had 2,000 patients and they're looking at eight compared with 10. Okay, so these are all huge studies and we are looking at quite a number of populations. Guess what they found? They found this, that none of these trials showed benefit to liberal transfusion, which again emphasizes the fact that you can go conservative. How about use of other products, erythropoietin or intravenous iron as adjunct to red blood cell transfusion? Many times when you have cancer patients, we only think about giving them blood. We don't think of other options. In this study that uh, appeared in the, that was published in the British Journal of Hematology, it was a, a prospective randomized trial that recruited 334 participants. They randomized erythropoietin compared to placebo. And of course, as you can rightly see here, the percentage of patients responding was higher in those where they got adjuvant erythropoietin. Erythropoietin, to remind you, is a stimulating factor that helps red blood cells come up. Okay? Going back to platelet transfusion in cancer, what I was trying to explain is this, that before chemotherapy, you have a bone marrow that is nicely decorated with cells. All those yellows you see are megakaryocytes, and then the other cancer cells are there and other normal cells. So here is the initial one before treatment. And then after treatment, you notice that there's a lot of space that, and the cells have all disappeared. This is what happens, that bone, uh, uh, the, the megakaryocytes that make platelets are all cleared, as well as other cells after chemotherapy. The indications for platelet transfusion are, is actually one, bleeding. But we can give platelets to prevent bleeding, what we call prophylactic platelet transfusion, to reduce the risk of hemorrhage when platelet counts fall below a certain threshold. And some studies, I mean, in the Journal of Clinical Oncology, they say in acute leukemia we could transfuse when the platelet count is 10,000. For solid tumors, 10 to 20,000. And for invasive procedures, 40 to 50,000. But of course, when it comes to treating bleeding, then we use therapeutic, I mean, when someone is bleeding, you don't have to wait, you have to give them the platelets. So, again, recent clinical trials suggest that we can conserve platelets, the way we've seen for red cells. And in the platelet dose trial, or no, also known as the Play-Doh trial, this was a multi-center randomized control trial in the United States among hematology and oncology patients. And it was rather a big study of 1,272 patients. They were looking at platelets of less than 1,000 per microliter. And patients were randomized to getting three units, six units, or 12 units. 
and the outcome was the percentage of days with WHO grade, grade two or less leading. Okay? I think it's supposed to be the other way around. With clinically significant bleeding. That's what I meant. And the finding was that for those who got three units, 71%, six units, 69%, 12 units, 70%. And I think from this you can tell that three units, which is half the dose, was as good as six units for preventing bleeding. So which one do you go for? When you know that our demand far exceeds the supply, I think we may have to go the conservative way. Does that make sense? Okay. The TOPS trial, they looked at uh, whether there's any value for prophylactic platelet transfusion. Do we actually need to prevent bleeding? Prospective randomized controlled trial in adults with a mean age of 55 years. They had 42% myeloma, 35% lymphoma, and AML 18%. They were randomized uh, platelets for 10,000 versus no platelet, except for those who are bleeding. And they had 70% who underwent autologous stem cell, then induction, then allogeneic transplant. And these were the findings. When you look at uh, these grades, this kind of bleeding is not clinically significant, but it's just nuisance bleeding. Here we talk about clinically significant bleeding, and of course this is, when you go to above four, it is uh, more bleeding. And again here, they were looking at no prophylaxis and prophylaxis. How do we conclude on this? Any ideas? To me, I look at this one. There's not, I mean, there's a significant difference. How about this? When you fail, we call on Sunny and we all discuss it. Is there value for prophylactic platelet transfusion? Those were significantly bleeding, and the p-value is that. Anyway, when we go for discussion, we are going to continue with that. Lastly, we talk about use of other medicines. Tranexamic acid has been used in uh, trauma. It is not very expensive. It inhibits lysis of clots. In three randomized trials in leukemia, there's the Visati trial, which was placebo, and then 22 units of platelets, tranexamic acid, and then another one that appeared in the Journal of Leukemia Lymphoma, and then another one where they're looking at use of tranexamic acid or uh, this other agent, amino caproic acid. They were looking at this to see if actually they can help reduce on the bleeding uh, amount. And I think all these studies can show that we can reduce on platelets by use of other products, by use of tranexamic acid, which inhibits clot lysis. It is uh, uh, an inhibitor of uh, lysis of clots. And if you further look at this, you might find actually it makes a lot of sense when you give patients tranexamic acid or amino caproic acid to prevent bleeding. Where are we going? What should we look at? in terms of transfusion in cancer care in sub-Saharan Africa. I think taking advantage of recent studies, develop guidelines specific for cancer care in Africa based on the conservative use of blood transfusion. I think we are seeing a lot of evidence and we are also collecting evidence that is going to help us develop guidelines. We need to implement new programs to reduce variability in practice and thus reduce unnecessary transfusions. There's a tendency of many of us saying, me, this is how I do it. If there's a way we can implement these programs to reduce on variability in practice and to explore pharmaceutical agents that can further reduce transfusions. 
Taken together, this approach can promote greater access to cancer care, less strain on national blood resources, and less risk to each patient. I'll stop here.